thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It is a pleasure to see you all uh, this morning here in, in where I am in, in Virginia. And um, just, just totally uh, appreciative of these fascinating presentations that I've heard thus far and, and just kind of identifying ways that they all interconnect. It's, it's, it's some wonderful work. So I look forward to the discussion later. <clears throat> Uh, there's a slight change in the title uh, that came about as I kind of further thought about this topic, as you know, that happens in scholarship as we further ponder um, on our research, new questions, new ideas, and what have you come to mind. So the fire this time, heritage terrorism and Black church burnings during the, during the modern justice movement, uh, this title is a riff off of James Baldwin's classic novel, or classic nonfiction, excuse me, book, The Fire Next Time, written in 1963 during the height of the civil rights movement where he is humanizing blackness and issuing a warning about the deleterious effects of racism and how it will result in our collective demise. Um, the book remains relevant as we assess the racial tensions since the 1960s civil rights movement accompanied by varied forms of violence and prompts the question, are we better off or do things simply look different? Uh, the questions resonate with me as I um, examine vintage racist violence, such as church arsons. And I'm thinking about what do the fires mean this time? Is it backlash to removing Confederate symbols throughout the United States, particularly in the American South? Um, is it pure speculation, speculation uh, that someone burned the church for racist reasons? In some cases it is, and but oftentimes it's intentional. But most importantly, how are Black communities interpreting and, and responding to these tragedies during what I call, what I argue is a new nadir of American race relations? So these are some directions this presentation is going to take. Um, I'm going to kind of give you a background as to how I arrived to this topic. Then I'm going to edge into the central argument. And I'm also going to kind of briefly discuss the methods that I used um, in, uh, in this particular research project. I'm also gonna kind of focus on three stories that I think are pertinent to this discussion. And I'm um, doing our question and answer section, I, I can lean more into the significance of the study. Um, and, and like I said, I'll provide some, some notes in the conclusion as to the significance of it. Let's see, but I wanna preface this um, by stating that the black church is not a monolith, but is as diverse as uh, Black people. However, its prevailing place in the historical arc of social movements spurred by African Americans can't be denied. The 19 sites of burning, arson, and vandalism analyzed in this study consist of Protestant and non-Protestant churches. I define the Black church as any place where Black people create spiritual sanctuary. I also like to give a disclaimer uh, that some information and images will be, uh, might provoke emotion as photos of uh, burning churches can be triggering for some. So how did I arrive to this topic? Um, as the Black Lives Matter movement was brewing and urban rebellion sparked around the country from St. Louis to Baltimore and New York in response to police brutality against Black citizens, I reflected on the continuation of racist violence in the United States of America and started to critique this notion of racial progress more deeply. I was also puzzled by confirmed Black church arsons, particularly ones linked to racist violence, as Black churches were clearly not the site of political protests as they were more than 50 years ago during the civil rights movement of the 1960s. However, it remains a place of black autonomy, which is always often perceived as a threat in a society where black lives are devalued. So the research is partly building on the 2008 publication, Burning Faith, Black Church, uh, church Arsons in the American South by Dr. Christopher Strain. His study is groundbreaking in that it is among the few academic texts to solely examine church burnings. He focuses on the hundreds of churches burned in the 1990s that led to the Church Arson Prevention Act of 1996 and uh, the Church Arson Task Force, where the alarming rates of church arsons, particularly black churches, led to both sides of the House of Representatives passing the Church Arson Prevention Act of 1996, which prompted federal, more federal investigations and prosecutions of church arsonists. It is important to note that such legislative, um, such legislative enactment did not occur without the persistence of black church leaders, politicians, and the NAACP challenging the nature of these investigations. Um, the task force ended in 
after the Clinton administration in 2000, but I argue that it should be reinstated considering the present rise of white nationalism. So Strain is instrumental in providing details on the formation of this task force. And I also have some slides in terms of the type of data that was captured during this time uh, by this particular um, task force that was in place that was deeply analyzing and investigating the burnings from um, the early 90s on up to 2000. And this is the type of data that is captured uh, at that particular time. This data, of course, doesn't type of data doesn't exist now. Um, and so I found this to be very, very a very, very interesting source. Um, and thinking about how relevant it would be if this particular data still existed. And so this was kind of the results of that data, 945 investigations uh, into 945 arsons, uh, 431 arrests. Also, the number of uh, arsons began to also decrease. But um, there was also a grassroots effort taking place. Uh, during this particular time, the National Coalition of Burned Churches, which evolved, um, which was doing their own independent research in addition to the federal investigations that were taking place, and they found that there were actually more um, burnings and arsons that were taking place, and they understood these communities more deeply, and they understood uh, the historical context that, um, that probably pr uh, prompted some of this particular violence that was taking place. Um, the group disbanded in, um, in about 2011, but it was kind of moving in the direction of not only focusing on black churches, but also synagogues and mosques as well. And it also began to expand into uh, advocacy and education. So again, Strain is instrumental in providing the details on the, on the formation of, of not just this group, but also the Arson Task Force. But our work, of course, is, um, is both exploratory, but differs in some aspects. For an example, geography. Uh, my particular research is not limited to the American South. I'm looking, um, I'm actually looking more broadly and examining this type of racial violence. I wanted to underscore that it's not necessarily limited to a particular geographic uh, setting. Uh, my exploration starts in New England region and also pivots to parts of the Midwest. Um, I also um, focus on Black, in addition to focus on Black church burnings, I also focus on the desecration of, a, of adjoining spaces such as Black cemeteries. Also, uh, the study of Black churches, particularly recent ones, uh, Black church arsons, uh, warrant more than a historical treatment, but the interdisciplinary approach of critical heritage studies that I use. Um, the 2012 Association for Critical Heritage Studies Manifesto outlines the nature of our research. Critical heritage studies will ask many uncomfortable questions of traditional ways of thinking and about and doing heritage, and that the interests of the marginalized and excluded would be brought to the forefront when posing these questions. And so the burning of African-American places of worship is an age-old fear tactic historically and recently used by white vigilante terrorists to quell Black social and political agency. The Black church, I argue, is more than a cultural artifact evolving from slavery and racial segregation, but a living organism that has shaped the, the socio-political movements of America's past and remains culturally relevant to many Black Americans. In Liberating Black Church, Making It Plain, Professor Juan Floyd Thomas describes a historic Black church as a radical institution steeped in justice. In the years after slavery was abolished, the historic Black church tradition became more important, the most important institution among African Americans. The studies suggest some of the most recent Black church burnings from the years 2008 to 2016 following, follow similar patterns to those in years past. Black church arsons largely occur following or during movements challenging America's racial status quo. The backstory of many early Black church burnings is shrouded in mystery are some of the most, as some of the most recent fires. I posit that whether the fires are the result of an act of nature or malicious intent, the loss always nearly results in grief for those affiliated with the institution that is the bedrock of many, many Black communities. I examine specific arts and cases and explain the implications burnings have on the tangible and intangible uh, heritage of communities impacted. I also emphasize the strength and tenacity of these congregations and communities I'll discuss in a moment. History is littered with cases where Black communities such as Greenwood, known as Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Rosewood in Levy County, Florida, and Black neighborhoods 
in East St. Louis, Missouri were singed in the early 1900s by angry white mobs, simply because the idea of a black autonomous and self-sustaining commonwealth was contrary to racist ideologies. The outbreak of black church fires, what I call, during what I call the age of Obama, occurred in the period following the election of America's first black president. His election to the highest office of the land was not an indicator that the country's deep stain of racism was clean. I argue his presidency was partially noteworthy because it was the litmus test for racial progress in America. In Making All Black Lives Matter, Reimagining Freedom in the 21st Century, historian and activist Barbara Ransby offers insight on Obama's election as president and the fledgling activism related, relating to issues of anti-Blackness. The honeymoon eventually wore off for many, and Black activists confronted the hard reality that simply having a Black family in the White House was not going to save Black families in general. Ransby further dismisses the idea of post-racialism following Obama's first election. While no reasonable person could argue that race or racism had been obliterated, that hundreds of years of white supremacy had been swept away in one fell swoop, many wanted to believe that blatant racism and unapologetic anti-Black racism of the past had been finally put to rest. One aspect of blatant racism we thought was long buried in the past was Black church burnings. As I mentioned, I take a closer look at Black church terrorizations following the racially motivated murders of eight church members and a pastor at Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina on the evening of June 17, 2015, by a white male seething with racial hate toward Black Americans. History repeated itself on many levels that dreadful day. Pro uh, Professor Mara McGinnis explains the legacy of hate resulting in the murder of parishioners in the essay, The First Attack, on Charleston's AME Church. The shooting is not simply the action of one deranged evil individual, but instead springs from our nation's long history of racial prejudice and violence against Black Americans. Again, it's also uh, hints at the central argument related to confirmed cases of Black church arsons from 2008 that they are not only related to a new nadir of American race relations, but is a, um, a continuation of terror inflicted on African Americans since our arrival to the new world. I researched the burnings of black churches in the early 20th century, the arsons of the 1990s during the terms of Bill Clinton and more recent church burnings um, under the administration of President Obama. And I asked myself, how are the fires this time any different than fires of the past? Though difficult to prove in numerous instances, I argued it was fueled by the same motive of racial hatred and that many black church arsons from 2008 and 2016 reiterated that there is no arc of safety for black bodies, not even in our churches or our final resting places. The first major lesson drawn from case studies I'll present uh, showed the fires um, Dennis Hate this time further underscores that freedom and liberty is a constant struggle for black people in America. The research of church arsons, burnings, vandalism is complicated for many reasons. Number one, the data is not always clear. Two, it's, it's traumatic. Lives are involved um, and often are forever changed. Also, there's not much written about it despite the reality. Um, however, it's important to examine these travesties in light of the mounting racial tensions leading to resistance movements spurred by local activists who have worked, who've been working in communities for decades to address poverty, food insecurity, gentrification, capitalist exploitation, and what I call heritage terrorism, which is a type of violence that is visited upon cultural spaces with the goal to exert social, political domination through fear and often erasure. It is a vain attempt to control the past and present narratives, whether through the burning of black churches, destroying or looting cultural artifacts of marginalized people, are sanitizing textbooks by targeting teachings that challenge and interrogate dominant narratives about the country's history and, and identity. So in terms of my methodologies, um, research on black church burnings and the impact of loss of cultural spaces warrants a broad range of primary and secondary uh, sources. Um, the qualitative uh, data used consists of oral history interviews, expert interviews and analysis of print and broadcast news stories. The, um, the quantitative data, uh, such as government agencies, um, 
as the AT ATF, which informed P uh, Pew Research Center studies and reports by the Southern Poverty Law Center to obtain statistical information on church arsons is also used in the analysis of burning trends. Um, the interviews are important because the data is often gray or silent. Uh, for an example, federal data on church arsons from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Explosives don't specify the racial demographics of churches, which is why the Church Arson Prevention Force uh, in 1996, a task force was created and dissolved in 2001. So where the data is ambiguous, I turn to the stories of those intimately tied to these sacred places. The discipline of heritage studies uh, and the methods uh, in heritage studies make space for the feelings and experiences of communities. So in the three burning cases I present to you, you'll hear the joys, the fear, and trepidation. Each story has a lesson, I believe, for modern activists. Roanoke Baptist Church, we'll first go to Hot Springs, Arkansas. Roanoke Baptist Church evolved from the clandestine gathering of formerly enslaved persons and possibly enslaved people in the 1860s to become one of the most influential places of worship um, for African Americans in South Central Arkansas. The case study begins with this burning of the historic Roanoke Baptist Church in Hot Springs um, on December the 22nd, 1963. The church was destroyed less than three months after the calamity struck the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, and claimed the lives of four young girls that further raised international attention about the civil rights struggle in America. The mysterious burning of Rono contextualizes the theory of heritage terrorism and provides this historical backdrop. Rono made an indelible impact on every aspect of Black life, not only in South Central Arkansas, but throughout the state with his dedication to educational empowerment and availability of service programs for youth and families. The church was the epicenter of Black life and culture. The first school for Blacks in Hot Springs was held at Rono. Also, Arkansas Baptist College, a historical Black college currently located in Little Rock, was founded at Rono Baptist Church. White resistance to Black activism related to integration in Hot Springs allegedly undergirds this tragedy. At the time, the church was pastored by Reverend Donald Rice, who was the president of the Hot Springs, um, Arkansas NAACP chapter, and was a firebrand of civil rights activists. During an oral history interview with Mr. Elmer Beard, a deacon during the time of this fire, he talked about the numerous threats Reverend, Ry Reverend Rice received from the Ku Klux Klan members because of his involvement in the NAACP. In his book, The Challenges, Untold Stories of African-Americans Who Changed the System in One Small Southern Municipality, Beard describes the troublesome early morning phone call the young pastor received moments before discovering the church was ablaze. At about 4.45 a.m., just about three days before Christmas 1963, a man assumed to be white phoned Reverend Rice. The caller declared, you have been warned to stop your troublemaking with the local NAACP. Now look out of your door and see what's happening to your church. Moments following the phone call, the mysterious person, the pastor looked with this mysterious person, the pastor looked out and saw the church ablaze. The Centennial Record reported the church suffered an estimated loss of $500,000, which was only partially covered by the church's insurance. Rice quite likely understood what could potentially happen to his church given recent tragedies at um, 16th Street Baptist Church. Because there was no physical evidence or suspects taken into custody, the cause of the fire is still considered undetermined and the church remains financially indebted by the fire over 50 years later. The truth of the burning incident remains partially concealed. The trauma caused by the burning of Roanoke Baptist Church has impacted several generations, but the congregation maintains its tradition of service and dedication to the community. Beard offers some perspective on Black church arsons during, the time, during this time in light of his, his experience. He states, the system does not know how protective we have to be of our own buildings when we take a stand for fairness and equality and justice. I don't think these fires should discourage our fight for civil and human rights. He underscored that the point that freedom in America is elusive and often costly for Black people. Our next case study is Macedonia Church of God in Christ in Springfield, Massachusetts. As I mentioned, arson incidents are not limited to the South. Uh, racist violence occurs from sea to shining sea and its, and its perpetrators know no boundaries. On election day, November 5th, 2008, America was on the brink of change with the election of the first black president. For some, a dream deferred became reality. 
The election of the black president in a country with an extensive history of racism was unprecedented. Election day of 2008 was a mixture of hope and despair for the pastor and members at Macedonia Church of God in Christ. The church was burned during a historic moment signaling change. I argue that the fire, be, the fire was beginning the fire was the beginning of numerous acts of racial terrorism occurring over the course of eight years and after where historic black churches are caught in the crossfire. Macedonia Church of God in Christ has an 80 year history in Springfield, Massachusetts. The church grew out of a migration of black people who left the South and settled in North American states, Northern states with the hopes of a better life free from the intensity of racial oppression, violence and political mar marginalization in the South. After years of occupying the downtown building, the congregants decided to build a new facility. The pastor and congregation worked for years to raise money and garner support and loans to begin the process. With the church nearing completion, the parishioners are ready to move into their new space and celebrate another milestone in the church's history, but the arson temporarily halted this reality. Three white men in their early, 20, mid, early to mid-20s, Benjamin Haskell, Thomas Gleason, and Michael Jock, See them with racial hatred, racial hatred invoke the type of terror reminiscent of the racial trauma endured by predecessors who migrated from the South. The church pastor, Bishop Bryan, not only summoned the courage to rebuild, but he also wanted the arsonists to be brought to justice based on the 1996 Church Arson Prevention Act. Reporter John Salzman of the Boston Globe offered a detailed review of the investigation, which revealed the calculated plot of the arsonists. They walked through the woods behind Gleason's house to to, to the back of the church on late November 4th, 2008, first to inspect the building. The three men returned to the church hours after Obama's election, doused the building inside and outside with gasoline and ignited a fire that completely destroyed the building. Salzman obtained the affidavit from an undercover FBI agent, which clearly indicated the motive of the arson. When the associate asked the man, who, uh, the man why they set the fire, the affidavit, state, affidavit stated, Haskell replied, because it was a black church. The affidavit indicates the suspects were angry about Obama becoming the first black president and clearly voiced dissent about his election. The FBI investigation eventually led to the arsonist prosecution. After nearly three years of legal battles, the arduous process of obtaining financing to rebuild the church and the distress that comes with the loss of place, Macedonia Church of God in Christ completed uh, their, their renovation and re, uh, reconstruction and opened the doors to the public on September the 20, uh, 24th, 2011. The church's building was a testament to the resilience that is reflective of Ma Macedonia's rich heritage as a fortifying space for generations of Black Americans in Springfield, in the Springfield region. However, bringing a deformed dream into fruition would not come without challenges. It would take the unity and benevolence of the local and broader community of supporters to not only re rebuild this physical structure, but to also restore the sense of hope that's often diminished by racial terror. Macedonia's um, arson story revealed key lessons. The racial reconciliation involves justice and accountability. Overcoming acts of racial hatred warrants a conscientious reaction from all demographics of the community. And it also further reveals that liberation is a collective process. Blood Christian Church in St. Louis, Missouri, our last stop. Blood Christian Church in Ferguson, Missouri, a suburb of St. Louis, was caught in the crossfire of what, Af what African-American scholar Ibram Kendi calls an urban rebellion in the Washington Post editorial where he described the progression of racism in the post-civil rights era. The November 24th fire came on the heels of the verdict to not indict Officer Darren Wilson for, the Michael, for Michael Brown Jr.'s murder. The church was centralized in a community that responded to Brown's murder in a way that changed the international conversation and consciousness of police brutality, especially as it relates to Black people. Black churches often become sites of healing, and in some cases, a center of resistance where, black, where lives are lost due to anti-Black violence. Sociologist and Black church scholar Kendra Barber analyzes the contemporary role of, black church, of the Black church in responding to racial inequity in Whither Shall I Go, the past and present of Black churches and the public sphere. She asserts, Black churches are among the few institutions providing race-specific remedies that have been abandoned in a colorblind era. Blood Christian Church was established on March the 31st, 2013 on Easter Sunday by late Carlton, Pastor Carlton Lee, a young pastor who became one of the most vocal faith leaders in the community during the Ferguson uprising. 
The church is also significant because it is the home church of Michael Brown Sr., the father of the slain teenager. The Flood Christian Church fire is distinctive in this study because it occurred in an urban center during a highly charged political protest. The fire is also shrouded in mystery and can be contextualized with other fires that occurred later in the St. Louis era, area. Lee established a space for communal empowerment and spiritual uplift as indicated on the church's website in the mission reads, flooding our community with God's love. Lee was thrust into the international spotlight as clergy activists following the murder of Michael Brown Jr. His involvement as clergy in the movement for Black Lives was noble, but came with scrutiny that he believed led to the burning of his church. As a representative for the Ferguson chapter of the, in, of the National Action Network founded by longtime activist Reverend Al Sharpton, Lee believed his call for the arrest of Officer Dan Wilson made the church the target of a potential hate crime. Blood Christian Church burning resulted in the rapid response of the Kansas City ATL field, um, but remains unresolved. The congregation struggles not only to recover the church from, uh, from the burning, but also they're recovering the death of the young pastor who answered the call of speaking truth to power, risking his life. He died of heart attack at the age of 34, June 13th, 2017, and will be remembered as a clergy activist in the movement for Black Lives. Although Lee transitioned as a, at a young age, he left a profound message that, that steeped in the Black church tradition that resonates, we're not running, we're not backing down. While writing the conclusion of this study, Black churches and cultural spaces continue to be burned. Of course, the issue of racism was obfuscated. Within the span of 10 days from March the 10th, 2019 to April 4th, 2019, in, southern, in a Southern Louisiana parish, three Black churches were burned. 21-year-old white male, Holden Matthews, was charged with a hate and uh, motivated arson in each, in each case and was sentenced to 25 years uh, for setting a fire to three historically Black churches. During the same time span of time, the churches were burned in Louisiana. The Highlander Research and Education Center was burned on March the 29th, 2019, resulting in the loss of decades of archival material related to the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. The center mobilized and trained hundreds of social change agents and hosted civil rights leaders such as Dr. Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. Highlanders burning is being investigated as a hate crime in light of a white power symbol found near the site. The recent and confirmed burning cases of Black church, churches and cultural spaces once again raised the discussion about the value of Black lives and the places tethered to our existence. So my conclusion is really a question that I ask uh, myself and other colleagues uh, who are pondering this topic. So what does the fire mean this time? I'm still trying to understand, but a quote by uh, Faulkner comes to mind that the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. The fires this time are emblematic of our racist past that fold into our present realities. The fire this time challenges our notions of progress. Are we better or do things just look different? Thank you.